uh, on the Ask Questions Live during the actual talk. So I think with that, and oh, I see folks also from San Francisco. Hello, Jim. Uh, I think with that, it's time we begin. I am thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Quantum Kiskit Live Seminar Series. I'm your host, Lot Kumina from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting Professor Austin Minnick, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Physics at Caltech. Hello, Austin. How are you today? Doing great. Thank you again for having me. The pleasure is ours. Uh, where are you tuning in from, Austin? Right now, I'm in uh, Pasadena, California, just a few miles south of the campus of Caltech. That sounds like a great place to be right now. Um, before we pull up your slides, Austin, allow me to give everyone a bit of an introduction and a background. Uh, Austin did his uh, PhD at MIT. He received his bachelor from also my uh, former alma mater, UC Berkeley. He has been a professor at Caltech since 2011 and holds many awards and honors, including the NSF Career Award, the ONR Young Investigator Award, and the ONR Director of Research Award. Uh, and I think with that, Austin, I think it's time we turn it over to you. And folks, feel free to ask questions during the talk. Great. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity to give this seminar. I'd also like to echo my thanks to everybody tuning in from all over the world, including uh, places where the time might be a little bit unusual for a seminar. So thank you again. Uh, today, I'm looking forward to talking to you about our efforts to simulate physical systems of interest on rapidly emerging and more capable near-term quantum hardware. So before I start, I just wanted to thank my uh, members of my group so right now we're about uh, eight graduate students from a variety of different fields, including mechanical engineering and applied physics, material science and electrical engineering. So thanks to all the students for their hard work on these topics. And I also wanted to briefly introduce my research group. So we're actually primarily a, a hardware group. We're interested in technology and pushing the limits of scientific instrumentation and of, of a large focus of our work is on low noise transistor microwave amplifiers that are used widely in science, uh, but particularly they're used in, as a component of the readout circuit for the qubits in quantum computers. Uh, in recent years, I've become interested in superconducting microwave systems and their possibilities for quantum simulation. And it's that topic that I'll talk to you about today. And then finally, before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge the collaborators in this work. This work was done jointly with uh, my colleague, Garnet Chan at Caltech, as well as Dr. Mario Mata, who's a colleague of uh, uh, your IBM uh, folks. And it's really been a, a great pleasure to work with both of them. And I also wanna thank IBM for providing a lot of the resources that you'll see that were used in this talk. This work is primarily uh, uh, carried out by the students shown here. All right, so many of you tuning in are, are interested uh, by the capabilities and the possibilities of near-term quantum hardware, where we define near-term as these devices that have order of tens or so of qubits, and they can execute with uh, reasonable fidelity uh, a circuit with gate depth on the order of also order tens to hundreds. And so it's an it's a interesting question that many people are asking. Uh, can quantum simulations be useful in the near term, or at least interesting, given such constraints? And what can we learn about the hardware and the improvements that we need to make to make these devices more capable from these simulation efforts? So in order to obtain physical uh, information that's just of, of interest, we need algorithms that carry out operations that lead to physically interesting and relevant answers. So the formal algorithms, for instance, to find ground state energies are algorithms like phase estimation. This is among the earliest uh, algorithms that, that has been proposed for this uh, type of purpose. And it has some advantages, meaning that you will get the exact ground state energy if you carry it out. Uh, but there's certainly some drawbacks, uh, among them being that the initial state you start the algorithm in needs good overlap with the ground state. And it, this circuit requires a, a lot of gates with a deep depth and uh, likely, therefore, requires error correction. 
So this type of algorithm is presently out of reach except for those simplest problems. At the other extreme, uh, a popular method that's been used is the variational quantum eigensolver. And in that method, we parameterize this wave function psi with some parameters theta, and then we minimize the energy to find an approximation to the true wave function. So this algorithm is nice because we, you can uh, use shallower circuits, but better results uh, in the sense of getting to the true wave function may require deep circuits in practice. And in addition, there's a high dimensional classical optimization that's required in order to make this algorithm work. So the questions that I'd like to address in this seminar are first, can we compute ground state properties without requiring an onsatz to be specified like in that parameterized wave function on the previous slide? Can we compute uh, more complicated observables like thermal averages, excitation spectra, uh, simulating dissipative systems that have non-unitary evolution and more on near-term devices? And we'd like to answer these questions in part to understand the limits of today's quantum hardware and stimulate uh, further hardware development. So I will address those topics today uh, with the, the following uh, components. So the first, I'll introduce a quantum imaginary time evolution algorithm that enables us to compute ground state and thermal properties without an onsatz. Second, I'll introduce our calculations of finite temperature excitation spectra using this algorithm. And finally, I'll discuss an app adaptation of the algorithm to simulate the real-time evolution of dissipative systems. So first up is this quantum imaginary time evolution algorithm that I'll call a uh, kite, as well as a, a thermal uh, average calculation algorithm that I'll refer to as QMEX, and I'll describe that acronym shortly. And this work was uh, uh, largely uh, or significantly done in, in, by uh, Mario Mata, who's now your colleague at IBM. So first of all, uh, let's just review the concept of imaginary time evolution. So suppose we have a Hamiltonian and we desire to find, uh, for instance, the energies of the eigenstates, uh, as well as thermal averages of observables. So if we have an observable O, quantum statistical mechanics tells us that we can get the thermal average of it by the equation shown at the lower left. So a common classical approach to compute that equation is to uh, evolve the system in imaginary time. So uh, this will be familiar to those who, who have done as quantum statistical mechanics. So we evolve in imaginary time and with some processing that can eventually lead us to a thermal average of an observable. So if we'd want to do this same strategy on a quantum computer, then we need a way to implement imaginary time evolution. Unfortunately, uh, you see that this operator is not unitary. And so the imaginary time evolution is, is not a natural one on a quantum computer. There's been a number of approaches to overcome or uh, address this limitation. So variational schemes like the one shown at the left have been proposed uh, as a way to uh, conduct this imaginary time evolution. This is showing an energy versus imaginary time from this variational scheme. And there's been a number of these related variational schemes. And the, uh, they, they seem to work in many cases, but it's still the case that they're constrained by the onsatz, meaning if you choose a poor representation of the wave function for your problem, then the uh, result will not be particularly accurate. So in Kite, we, uh, there's, it's a different approach that's taken. So we're, this approach is that we're approximating the non-unitary imaginary time evolution operator with the unitary operator. So uh, first to, to set up the problem, we would like to implement the operator shown in blue, which is not a unitary one. Uh, we choose or we'd like to approximate that operator with the red one, which is unitary. Now, how could we uh, approximate a non-unitary operator with a unitary one? Well, uh, let's consider in more uh, precise terms what we'd like to do. So we have a state shown at the top, and suppose we're focusing on those two red sites, uh, and the other gray ones are left unchanged uh, as we go from state one to state two. So you notice that the in this uh, 
setup, the red dots change into the blue ones, but the gray ones are unchanged. In particular, state two is the normalized state that's produced from imaginary time evolution. Now it turns out that there's a theorem, Ullman's theorem, that tells us that these two states are in fact related by unitary, pr uh, provided the two states have uh, what's known as nearby marginals, which means that the change in the state is confined to some local region like the, the two red dots. So this uh, fact, this theorem, tells us that in fact there is a unitary that performs the uh, imaginary time evolution from a original state to the normalized state produced by imaginary time evolution. So the only thing we have to do then is find the operator that best approximates uh, the blue operator. Okay, so our goal is to find the red operator that best approximates the blue one. To do that, we expand this operator A that you see at the left in uh, poly strings sigma with some unknown coefficients x. And we would like to minimize the distance between the state produced by the approximate imaginary time evolution delta and the actual one delta zero. So this is turning into a quadratic uh, optimization problem. And uh, as many of you may know, this turns into a just standard linear algebra problem where you have a matrix and a vector S and B, and the elements of that uh, matrix and vector are obtained by essentially performing tomography on the current state of the quantum computer to get the expectation values. You then use a classical computer to solve for those coefficients. So in a little bit more detail, you start from the computational basis you do whatever state preparation is necessary to get to the desired initial state. You would like to implement this blue operator. You would choose to approximate it with a unitary operator A, and the extent of that neighborhood is defined as capital D, the number of qubits in this neighborhood. And you, you figure out those coefficients as I described on the previous slide, and then you keep going. And so you iterate this and eventually you'll uh, get to the ground state. Or if you do a sampling approach, as I'll talk about, you can get thermal averages. So more on that, uh, suppose we would like to get the thermal average of an observable, which is indicated in the equation. Uh, the classical approach to do this is uh, among them, metropolis sampling, where you evolve the state and you implement a rejection criterion and you choose that at each stage so that you set up a Markov chain that gets you the correct thermal weights you need for the thermal average. The problem with this approach for a quantum computer is that there's not a straightforward way to implement this rejection step. You see the papers at the bottom have reported schemes that, that could do this, but the circuits that are required are quite deep. So it turns out that the kite algorithm can be very easily adapted to perform also thermal averages. Um, so the basic idea is we have a minimally entangled thermal states algorithm known as METS, which was introduced by the paper at the bottom for the classical case. And in this classical method, uh, it's essentially setting up a Markov chain to get the correct thermal weights. So the scheme is you start with the state at the top left, you evolve in imaginary time uh, as indicated by that, that blue uh, region. And you then you can compute some expectation value. Now at this step, you need to choose a way to uh, get to the next initial state in such a way that you get the correct thermal weights for the expectation value. And it turns out that all you have to do is, is essentially uh, collapse the state as uh, produced by that measurement in the first step and then start from that classical product state as the initial state for the next step. So you take the classical product state as shown at the top center of your screen, and you do the same thing again. You evolve in imaginary time, you measure, and then you collapse. And if you do this enough times, you'll obtain uh, capital M samples, and this turns out to give you the thermal average. And this is a very nice algorithm because no rejection step is required. And if you can perform imaginary time evolution, then you can perform this algorithm. So it's easy to implement. So hopefully you can see how it's uh, essentially trivial to adapt this concept to the kite algorithm. 
So you notice the only change on this slide is that instead of doing classical imaginary time evolution, you use kite on the quantum computer. And uh, that, that's really it. And then you get your METS samples and you add them up and this gives you a thermal average. And so this is in turn easy to implement on a quantum computer. Austin, maybe a couple quick yes. clarification questions, if you if we could. Yes. Um, in, I think, um, could you say a little bit more? Maybe we'll talk more about this, how the A operator is selected in Kite, um, sort of given your the desired uh, imaginary evolution you want, and maybe a bit about, I think you mentioned tomography, but maybe let's do this question first. <laughs> sure, yeah. So. So A is just a general operator consisting of poly strings on the red uh, sites that are indicated at the top left. And uh, without doing any uh, extra considerations, in general, it would consist of all possible poly strings on those red sites. So this is the uh, a general expansion for any operator. Mm. Uh, and we then seek to find the coefficients x that best mimic the uh, approximate the state that's produced by true imaginary time evolution at the lower left of your screen there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, if you do the math out, it turns into the linear algebra problem at the top right of your screen. And uh, by tomography, I just mean uh, you have to measure the expectation values of lots of poly strings. And mm -hmm. those uh, serve as the components of the S and the B. I see. And could we say something about the, the complexity or scaling cost related to, to this? Um, I suppose maybe there's a hope for sparsity here because the, the number of poly strings uh, is something like four to the n, I think. Yes, exactly. Yeah, good. I was uh, the, the next slide before we paused, I was about to, to get to that. Um, but I, I can say you're absolutely right in the, in the general case, as it must be. Uh, this algorithm is, is not efficient because there are exponentially required poly strings. And of course, that's a requirement of any uh, two local or more Hamiltonian that it has to be that way. Um, but it often turns out in physical systems that, uh, well, uh, I'm actually going to show a slide. So perhaps I can just pause on that one and address any other questions first. Mm, yeah, no, that, that, that's good. Um... Yeah, let's proceed. Thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah, that, that's a very good observation about um, the uh, complexity of the algorithm. So uh, again, as I was saying, in general, uh, for any general Hamiltonian, um, these, these correlations between the sites grow in imaginary time. And if they grow too much, then just like any other algorithm, this algorithm will, will not be efficient in finding the ground state. However, it turns out for many physical Hamiltonians, uh, these correlations have a limited spatial extent. So this, there's some numerical evidence of this. Uh, and this is a plot of uh, the y-axis is imaginary time. So you can imagine we're going from the bottom to the top. And the x-axis is the distance between pairs of qubits and just kind of units of um, you know, integer units between the sites. And the uh, color bar is the mutual information. So the kind of the measure of the correlations between the sites. So you can see as you go up on this diagram, uh, you're going forward in imaginary time. And the correlations do increase uh, with, with distance as you evolve. But at, at some large enough imaginary time, uh, they saturate. You can see that the lines become just vertical at the top of the screen. And so that's telling you that these correlations have a limited spatial extent. And in that case, your neighborhood size is bounded and therefore you can, uh, it's not required to use the full um, number of possible strings. So hopefully that helps address that question. And I guess the um, kind of assumption here is that one would be aware of the potential structure, because even if it's a sparse structure in the log sense here in the exponential of the generator, then uh, I guess you would, I guess you'd have to know a little bit about what that structure looks like uh, so that you know what to measure, or maybe there's some adaptive ideas to help to go about that. Yeah, what, what so it, you're, you're right. I mean, some of the things that can be done is you can, you can get an answer with a certain domain size and then increase the domain size and 
uh, hopefully observe that the answer that you are seeking, you know, as, as it saturates to some value, so converges. So it, in that sense, it's very similar to what you do for a classical numerical scheme when you're assessing convergence. And uh, yeah. out of curiosity, have have you guys studied or have you looked at um, sort of the required precision that one would need in estimating these poly string coefficients for because uh, if you measure it, there's going to be experimentally some error in the measurement. And so usually multi multiplicative error, uh, sorry, additive error. And um, that will, you know, propagate through the rest of your algorithm. So maybe it's very insensitive or maybe it's very sensitive. I, I don't know. Um, I wonder if there's sort of some ideas in that direction. Yeah, I would say we have, it's a, it's a very good point. We, we have empirical evidence that uh, without any kind of... Um, adjustments for that type of error, the linear system becomes very numerically uh, poorly conditioned. So you have to do a few tricks in the sense of uh, just allowing that numerical system to, to be solved. Once you do that, you're solving a problem in a least square sense. So it, the observation is the coefficients that you get out tend to um, essentially uh, uh, in some sense, average out the, the noise that is occurring due to statistical uncertainty with the, the measurements and so on. Um, that's the empirical evidence we've gained so far. Um, but it certainly is a consideration that the elements of the matrix are subject to some uncertainty. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah great. Thanks for the questions. So I'll, for now, I'll, I'll keep going to show some state-of-the-art in terms of actual hardware implementation as of 2019. So in the, in the beginning, uh, when we were doing this, these experiments were carried out on Rigetti's Aspen 1 chip, and it has the arrangement shown here. And we selected uh, qubits 14 and 15 uh, because they, they had the best qualities, uh, best performance. And I'm just showing you these for, for representative results to give you an idea of the, the state of the art at that time. So this is a plot of the energy uh, versus imaginary time. And you can see uh, this, is, this is just for one site. So it's a fairly trivial calculation. And you see, well, the, the energy decreases towards the exact value. And it's slightly below the exact value, mainly because of this readout error correction that leads to you know, the result uh, being corrected in kind of an unusual way. But generally, the, the correct trends are observed. Um, could you remind us what what beta is? Oh yes, thank you. So beta is imaginary time. So it's in units of of en uh, uh, inverse energy. Um, mm -hmm. So as beta goes to infinity, uh, that corresponds to zero temperature, and then you're reaching the ground state and, uh, at that uh, at large beta. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the the gate sequence, because uh, I think that this is a this is a uh, discrete time gate based uh, uh, application, right? Or maybe that's correct the, yeah um how does the how does the yeah i guess it's decomposed in terms of uh rounds of the protocol okay i think i see maybe. yeah yeah there's there's trotter steps and in each step we we carry out the the scheme i described earlier so you you carry out a round of gates and you measure and you solve for the coefficients x and then you implement that operator and you do it again, you, you implement that, and then you measure, and then you get the coefficients, and you just keep doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the points that you see are those discrete outcomes. And do we understand a little bit about what's causing the apparent sort of systematic offset? Is that, uh, is that just measurement error or something else? Or is it the problem? Um, readout error correction causes uh, the, the, these types of offsets in a way that's slightly hard to systematically explain, but we we do observe that uh, effect. Um, so for instance, schemes that are supposed to be variational, um, when you include readout error correction, then they turn out to not be. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it seems that readout error correction sort of breaks some aspects of those schemes. Oh, uh, you mean even if you apply a sort of readout error mitigation protocol on the uh, poly estimated observable values? Yeah, that's exactly what's been done in the left in both plots here. Yeah, got it. And um, our observation is that that 
apparently seems to break the variational nature of the scheme. Mm. Um, and a question from Narenda from the audience. Could you please explain why this particular poly terms, IZ plus EI plus XX are selected here? Oh yeah, this is just a, a toy Hamiltonian um, chosen uh, not not for any special reason, just one for which um, it's like a single site um, equivalent of some toy Hamiltonian, but there's not a special reason that we chose that one. Yeah, the um, you can see the the two site one is perhaps more recognizable as kind of like a, a icing model. Trend. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks for the questions. So. The uh, one site is on the left, and then the two site one, which is yeah, again just some toy Hamiltonian, is shown on the right. And the two curves that you see in different colors are different runs. Uh, and so you see there's some uh, you know, uncertainty from run to run. Generally, the correct behavior is, is observed, but you see that the quality of the result is worse than the left case. And that's because the two qubit gates are generally lower fidelity than the one qubit gates. So this is a representative result uh, for the ground state energy, which again is the, the value at the right portion of each plot. You can also compute the average, the thermal average of the Hamiltonian, which is the thermal average of the energy using this Q-METS algorithm. And that's what's shown on the, the left here. So the Black line is the exact. Um, QVM is the, the, referring to quantum virtual machine. So it's like an emulator. So the blue one is without noise. The orange one is with noise. Now you can see that those apparently track the exact one pretty well. But the hardware, the quantum processing unit, QPU, is, is, a, is getting the correct trend, but it's much worse. And our uh, best explanation that we can figure out for this difference is uh, the influence of crosstalk, which is not accounted for in the quantum virtual emulator, but does occur in the actual practice. All right. So this is the state of the art as of 2019. Um, so you, yep. What do we mean by crosstalk in the case of one qubit here? Oh, um, I, I think, if I recall correctly, um, at the time that we were running, they were running jobs simultaneously. And oh. so other people, uh, you know, the things that they were running could get ended, ending up in, in ours. And mm -hmm. that was, <laughs> that was basically what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was, that was my recollection. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, yes. So the question is, you know, how can we take these results and obviously make them better, apply them to more sites, and also compute things besides just uh, expectation values of energy, which, of course, is a useful property, but in practice is not the most interesting one. So that is the second portion of this talk, where I'll describe how we are able to compute correlation functions and excitation spectra at finite temperature and on more sites. And in this case, the, all of these experiments were done on IBM quantum hardware, as I'll describe. OK, so correlation functions. Um, th these are important for quantum many body systems because they contain a lot of information about the physics of the system. So for instance, uh, they tell you about the excitations, um, uh, the static structure, like the magnetization, and many other quantities. So we really like, we would like to be able to compute these. The circuit to compute them in general is shown on the screen. So the idea is you have an ancillary bit, and you perform some controlled operations with the uh, time evolution of the system in the middle. And if you do the math, it turns out that if you measure the appropriate thing on the ancilla, you get uh, the real part and the imaginary part of the correlation function uh, u v, and once you have that versus time, you can do a lot of things uh, with it, as I'll show. So this algorithm has been known for about twenty years, uh, and, and so it's it's well understood. Um, 
we would like to make this circuit compute this correlation function at finite temperature. Now, if you uh, recollect the first part of the talk, you can do that very, very easily with a sampling algorithm by simply inserting kite as the first step on the system register. So if you do that, and then you execute the correlation function circuit, and uh, you can compute samples for that METS algorithm on the system. So you repeat this several times. And by doing that, you're averaging over imaginary time, and, and that will give you the thermal average of this correlation function. So if you have this, this allows you to investigate things like phase transitions and so on, or investigate phase diagrams of quantum many-body systems. So this would be a very useful thing to know. So the conceptual uh, setup, you know, it's straightforward, right? There's complications, though, is that clearly these circuits are much more uh, complicated than the ones in the first part of the talk. So for instance, for two sites, it takes about 12 C knots per uh, kite step. And that's just the kite step. You still have to execute the real time step. If you do four sites, you quickly swell to 240 C knots per kite step. And that's well beyond the capability of, of any machine now. And that's not even including the controlled and the real time evolution that you need. So we, we need a scheme to reduce these resources. So the way that we do that is we exploit the fact that many physical systems exhibit symmetries and we can use those symmetries to reduce the number of poly strings we need to include in the kite step. So consider for concreteness, this transverse field icing model. Uh, it's uh, fairly straightforward to observe that this Hamiltonian has a symmetry ZZ, which means all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute with ZZ. And given the Hamiltonian has this symmetry, all the kite operators that are based on this Hamiltonian should exhibit the same symmetry. So there's a sequence of steps by, that uh, we have figured out by which you can take the poly strings on two qubits and reduce them very dramatically. So that's shown in this sequence. So if you can start with me on the left, on two qubits, we have 16 total possible poly strings. Now, in the original paper uh, that I've described, to go from the first to the second step, it turns out you only need poly strings with an odd number of Ys because the state and the operators of, of for kite are all real. And if you have an even number of Ys, it turns out you get imaginary operators. So uh, for that reason, you go from 16 to six. Then it turns out that of those six, you need the, the remaining strings to commute with the Hamiltonian. And so that gets you from six to two. And finally, it turns out that X, Y, and Y, X uh, do the same thing in the sense that one just implements the negative of the other. So from that, you get down to X, Y is the only unique poly string that you need in this, in this example. Generalizing this, if you have uh, D equals two and one discrete symmetry referred to as Z2 symmetry, as I just showed, you go from six to one. For D equals four, if you have one symmetry, 120 to 28. And if you have D equals four and two symmetries, you go from 120 to six. And so this is the key to enabling, uh, without approximation, these uh, simulations to be carried out. Now, if you're a specialist in the field, um, IBM's own Sergey Bravi actually introduced this tapering off qubits paper. And the scheme that I've described is formally similar to that paper. Uh, in, in his paper, he figured out a way to reduce the weight of the poly strings in the Hamiltonian rather than reduce the number of measurements that need to be done. And it turns out that that scheme is, is less optimal for kite in practice. And so, Instead of using the scheme as he described it, we have done the scheme that I've just introduced. Okay, so we carried out these calculations on IBM Q hardware, IBM Q Bogota and Rome. So each of these are five qubit devices arranged in a chain with nearest neighbor interactions, and the error rates for single qubit and C knots are on the order indicated there. So here's some initial results. This is the uh, 
xx correlation function at a certain temperature, which tells you about the, um, the, uh, uh, the alignment of the spins versus imaginary time. The black line is the exact result, and the green is the raw data, uh, meaning that's, that's what you get out of the machine. It's not so bad. It's clearly better than uh, the equivalent result from 2019. But, you know, we always want it to be better. So are there other strategies we can use to improve? Uh, that's the question. And it turns out, indeed, there are. So, um, you know, due to time, I'm going to just highlight the key points of these various schemes. Uh, one of them is post-selection. So if you start in a state with some given parity, plus or minus one of the symmetry operator, well, uh, because the kite operators all commute with the symmetry operator, that parity cannot be changed by kite evolution. So suppose you start with plus one, at the end of the algorithm, you could check the parity, and if it's the wrong parity, you know that something happened and you can discard that run. The problem, of course, is that you also need to measure the poly string. And if you do this parity check, then you're not measuring the thing that you really need. Fortunately, there's now many schemes that are introduced of how you introduce Clifford circuits, the ones like uh, that are shown in this dashed box, that allow you to simultaneously measure commuting poly strings. And so you introduce this type of circuit in the beginning, uh, or after the kite step, right before the measurement, and that allows you to discard states with the wrong parity. So here's an example of the improvement that you obtain for post-selection. And you can see it's small, but it's, not, not, it's clearly better. When you com combine that with readout error mitigation and post-selection, you can see from these two plots that the, if you focus on the purple curve, for instance, on the left, you see the final result is in general in better agreement with the exact result compared to the green or the, the reddish. So these are the schemes that we've applied. Finally, for two qubits, there turns out to be a particularly simple uh, outcome, which is that the kite steps, actually, regardless of how many steps you take, can be compressed into a single, uh, or into the circuit that, that's shown here. So it's a single step of kite. Okay, so uh, it's essentially, regardless of the depth uh, of the imaginary time, the depth of the circuit remains fixed. And a similar consideration applies for real-time evolution using the KAK decomposition. So uh, regardless of the real-time uh, uh, length, the circuit is of, of fixed depth. That's a special case for two qubits that we will not use for the subsequent results, but we use it here. OK, so here are some representative results. First, I'll show static observables for a two-site transverse field icing model with the Hamiltonian shown. This is the uh, average thermal average energy versus imaginary time for different values of that coupling constant J. The solid line is the exact, and the dashed with the symbols is the hardware result. And you can see these are really quite, uh, quite good acknowledging that there's a lot of nice simplifications that occurs for two qubits. Similarly, this is the uh, xx correlation function between sites 0 and 1. Uh, and you notice that for larger values of the coupling constant, like j equals 3, the correlation function tends to a value of near negative 1 at high beta. And what that indicates is that the system is minimizing its energy by having the spins point in opposite directions, so anti-ferromagnetic order, so like this. So some physics is actually coming out of these, uh, these calculations. So let's move on to something more complicated. So we have a ZZ uh, dynamical correlation function. And this is a particularly important quantity in general uh, because such a... Uh, correlation function contains information on the excitations of the system. So this correlation function in particular tells us about the uh, excitations within the Z uh, eigenstates. Austin, there were two questions yes. uh, from yes. the slides ago, maybe before we move on sure. to the next session, yeah. we can yeah. bring these up. Um, 
Right. I think one of them you had talked about reduction earlier. Somebody had asked about other strategies for reduction. I, I don't know if you wanted to comment more on that. Um, further strategies for reduction as in here? Um, I think earlier on uh, on the uh, probably on the symmetry slide, but maybe if the oh, okay I'll ask this question um, I, as well. I don't. Yeah. I, it, well, if there's any further opportunities, um, so far as we understand, I think what we found is the is the optimal in the sense that there's there's no further reduction possible. Um, mm -hmm. it, it really depends on the discrete symmetries that the Hamiltonian possesses. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, I don't know if that addresses the question, but that's generally my conclusion. Yeah. Got it. And uh, the other question was on uh, the, I, around 1.2, I think, in one of the energy curves, there was a kink, and uh, someone was interested to know a little bit about what yeah. that to do with. Yeah. Um, you, you see these, you notice in the uh, on the left plot, in the kind of pinkish curve, there's a, a little dip around 0.2 nine or 1.0 in beta and then you notice the one in purple around 1.4 and you know these things happen because uh well there's um stochastic uncertainties because each of these points is resulting from 8,000 shots so there's statistical uncertainty there's um the fact that uh, uh, there's you know, stochastic errors or um, decoherence of, of qubits and so on in the actual device that introduces further uncertainty. Um, even the the time at which the result was taken, the system itself can uh, you know shift a little bit. You know, you have these two level systems that affect the qubits and over the time scale of hours that can uh, you know shift the quality of the gates that are getting implemented. Mm -hmm. So all of these things together can lead to the observations like what you're seeing in the slide. Um, and the points at beta zero, uh, you'd expect all of those to be at zero, I take it? Right, yeah. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so the, um, there, there, so re readout error mitigation can cause uh, those types of correction, or not corrections, but it can cause those artifacts to appear. This, um, I believe, yeah, both of, let's see, well, um, I would say generally readout error related issues can cause those types of effects. And when you do mitigation that can improve them somewhat, but they still occur. Um, the other thing that can happen, which I, I can't recall if it occurred in this case, but uh, in these circuits, the ancilla is executing something and then waiting around for some time and, and until the other circuit is done. And it's possible that even at zero time, we had set it up so that uh, we just waited that duration anyway to make it consistent with all the other points. And while the ancilla is waiting around, it can um, undergo amplitude and phase damping, and that mm. can affect the final result in this type of way as well. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks for the questions. Uh, so let's move on to, yes, the dynamical correlation function. And I was just getting to show uh, an example result. So this is the real part of the correlation function. The black line is the exact, the orange and the symbols is the hardware. And if you look closely at it, it really agrees pretty well. So this is for beta equals 0.2s, which is a, a, a relatively small imaginary time, which means a high temperature. Here's imaginary portion of that. And again, you know, it, it's not perfect, but it agrees pretty well. So um, this is encouraging because these circuits are really much more complicated than what I showed in the first part of the talk. You can also compute these at different temperatures, beta. So beta equals 1.8 is a much lower temperature than beta 0.2. And, you know, it, you see some squiggles. You can, if you focus a little bit, you see they're a little bit different, um, but well, they you, you know they look like squiggles. So we'd like to make better sense of these squiggles by processing this data in some way, and particularly we'd like to process it so we can infer whether the finite temperature physics has successfully made it in 
to these squiggles. So what you do when you're looking at, at uh, curves like this is you, know, you see a lot of oscillations. And so Fourier transform should come to mind right away. And physically, there's a reason to do this, which is that the Fourier transform reveals excitation energies. Okay, so if you take that dynamical correlation function, Fourier transform it, you'll get this uh, kind of spectral density equivalent, S, on the left. And the magnitude of that tells you the uh, amplitudes of the various frequency components present in your signal. So this is amplitude squared of that S versus that frequency in uh, units of energy for beta equals 0.2. So this is telling you that your signal is composed of sinusoids of discrete frequencies, and they have the following amplitudes indicated. Now, uh, if you do that for the, the exact signal, then you get the blue result. And you can see that the hardware has successfully gotten the uh, frequencies, the discrete frequencies, as well as pretty well obtained the correct amplitudes. Now, to make sure or to understand more physically, if we did get the correct amplitudes, we can plot the magnitude of that S squared versus beta on the left plot uh, for the ground state on the left, and the same thing for the excited state, the first one on the right. And basically, these amplitudes should have uh, a weight related to a Boltzmann factor. Okay, so we can do the calculation for a bunch of different beta. And here's the result. Uh, and you can see you it's, it's not perfect, but it certainly gets the trends correct. So this is indicating that we've successfully turned those squiggles into some finite temperature physics uh, that's being successfully reproduced on the hardware. Quick question, maybe on yeah. the largest sort of beta in time evolution. What's the typical depth of uh, actual gates that are being applied on the actual execution? Uh, yes, so for, for two qubits, the depth is independent of beta because of the um, simplification I described earlier. Oh, I so see. these circuits on the order of 10 C knots, uh, regardless of beta. Got it, okay. All right, so let's move on to uh, four qubits. So, uh, we talked about d equals 2, there's, there's 12 c naughts per kite step. Uh, d equals 4, there ends up, even with the simplifications that uh, I've, I've described before, there's more than 50 c naughts per kite step. And it, it turns out that you can execute maybe one step of imaginary time, but it's really quite difficult to do anything uh, non-trivial or physically interesting with just the framework I've described. So Rather unfortunately, additional methods to reduce circuit depth are necessary for these calculations. And so those essentially are, go under the name circuit recompilation, which is where you take your deep circuit and you use classical resources to identify a lower depth circuit that matches the output of this deeper circuit. So in this case, we have what's known as a, or called a base layer in the red, and then we follow that by multiple rounds where you have these C knots and single qubit gates interleaved with A, B, A, B. And we optimize the parameters of those gates to best reproduce uh, or to minimize this cost function shown at the bottom of the screen. So for kite, we have a base layer in three rounds. For real-time evolution, we have a base layer in five rounds. Uh, okay, so we can Unfortunately, there's not much choice to, that we have to do this, but we can see how it works. So this is a plot again of finite temperature energy on the left versus beta and the same XX correlation function versus beta on the right. Mm -hmm. The purple or pinkish color is the full circuit without any recompilation and the purple is the recompiled. And you can see, especially in the case of the XX correlation function, there's really a, a, a notable difference. And so practically this recompilation turns out to be important. How close are the recompiled circuits to certain in, in their unitary, I suppose, uh, to the uh, expanded version? It, the fidelity for the state is order 0.999 in most cases. So you get very close. Okay, I see. 
Um, and uh, how is that actually, uh, how is the mapping performed or the, op the, the optimization? It's just a classical, um, you know, your standard numerical optimization tool. Uh, and so you have, you have two vectors. One is the vector that's the right one. And then one is the vector that's produced by your recompiled circuit. And you have a bunch of variables like angles within the recompiled circuit that you adjust. So it's yeah. it's just a normal optimization problem. And this is a uh, sort of a home built uh, thing, I guess. Um, it's using some libraries in like in Mountain Pi and um, SciPy and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. All right, so here's dynamical correlation functions on four sites, and this is for beta equals 0.2. Now, if you look uh, pretty closely, it's actually not so bad. These circuits are of increasing depth as, as real time goes on. Um, so even despite that, uh, you, you actually end up doing reasonably well, although generally things get worse as time goes on. But you do notice that in the imaginary time, it's, it's quite poor in, in the beginning, and there seems to be some sort of phase shift throughout the entire real time. And that's related to this ancilla decoherence that I mentioned before. Uh, while the ancilla is waiting for the system register to execute its circuit, it's just waiting around. And it can undergo uh, various dephasing and damping processes that lead to the outcome to us, the user, that the imaginary part of this correlation function is quite poor. Um, fortunately, there are some physics we can use to correct that. And this is known as a phase and scale correction. And it's just pointing out that we know that physically at time equals zero, the operator Z just squares to one. So the, the expectation value of it should just be the number one without any imaginary part. So this phase and scale correction uh, is post-processed just by dividing the true value on the right of the numerator of the equation by its value at time equals zero, and that ensures that the requirement at the top of your screen is actually met. And so once you do this, you get really quite good agreement, um, acknowledging that there was some classical help to produce these circuits. Finally, you can Fourier transform just as you did before, and you find that you're getting this finite temperature physics reasonably uh, from the hardware, from, as evidenced by the amplitudes of these um, peaks. All right, so hopefully I've shown you that finite temperature physics with four spins is indeed possible on near-term devices. Um, and hopefully you can also get us a, a sense of the limits of, the, of today's hardware. So our present studies have shown that with this recompilation step, you can do finite temperature physics on order of 10 spins uh, and circuit depth on the order of tens and approaching 100 C knots. So that gives you a sense of the magnitude of the circuit that can be carried out uh, on, on today's hardware. All right, so uh, in, in the last five minutes or so, I would like to describe the last part of the talk which is on a related but slightly different topic, non-unitary dynamics of dissipative spin systems. So until now, we've used Kite to perform imaginary time evolution only. But it's worthwhile to ask if this same concept can be applied to other types of problems. So again, consider the icing model. And we already know it's unitary dynamics can be simulated on a quantum simulator. But of course, in real life, just like the qubits, most systems are not uh, closed and have unitary dynamics, but rather they're open, meaning they interact with some environment that we generally don't know much about. And the resulting dynamics of such a system are not unitary. So we are asking whether we can use the concepts of kite for general non-unitary evolution. There have been a number of uh, schemes proposed in the past to simulate open quantum systems on quantum devices, uh, among them including representing the environment with qubits, using the natural decoherence of the actual qubits to simulate open systems, and then some variational methods. 
And these schemes, just like any scheme, they have their various advantages and, and drawbacks. Uh, you can see from the figure at the lower right that the, the, the variational scheme, just as before, can produce nice results at the cost of having to specify an onsets that may not be correct, for example. All right, so we would like to see how to adapt Kite to this problem. So now we're considering the time evolution of the density matrix rho. And in this Markovian approximation, we have a unitary component in blue and then the non-unitary part in red. And the non-unitary part is characterized by these Lindblad operators L, which for instance, if you are having the system in contact with a bath, spontaneous emission means uh, you emit some photon to the bath, sigma minus. Whereas the, if you have a bath at some temperature, it can provide photons to the system leading to sigma plus. So now I'll briefly describe how you can in fact use kite to simulate this equation. So first you take the density matrix and you vectorize it. And so that leads to uh, requiring uh, one to double the number of qubits compared to the uh, just that of the system only. So that's the cost of this approach. Once you do that, you get a master equation that consists of, a, it's a Schrodinger equation with a Hermitian, but also an anti-Hermitian term. And it's the anti-Hermitian term that causes us problems because when we trotterize and try to propagate in real time, or in, in forward, in, in forward rather, um, there's a unitary portion in black that you can just simulate without any problem, but there's also this non-unitary portion. Normally this is a problem, but we now understand how we can use kite to treat that particular term. And so that means that we can actually perform quantum simulation on an open n-spin system with two n qubits, and our kite algorithm. So again, the cost of this approach is doubling the qubits, but you're able to carry out the evolution without an ansatz. As a representative example, consider a two-level system, TLS, in an external driving field, uh, it's indicated by H, and, and coupled to a bath with some decay rate gamma. So the system Hamiltonian is, is, is just for, for uh, reference, is shown at the top right of your screen. The open system, quantum, open system equation of motion for this particular case is shown right below it. And it contains terms involving the system. And if all those terms are local, then all the terms in the, the master equation end up being local. So there'll be terms for the system as indicated by the two black uh, equations in the kind of center of your screen. But there'll also be equations in like those in red or terms rather that act on the doubled system. And that's including the environment plus the system. And so we have to implement terms of that type. All right, so just as uh, an example result, suppose we have a system starting in an initial excited state that uh, when you vectorize the density matrix, that actually turns out to mean you just start the system in uh, ket 0, 0, which is exactly what's shown on the screen here. And we're going to compute the excited state and ground state populations versus time. So first, uh, the y-axis is population versus time on the real or on, on the x-axis. And the uh, ground state is in green. Uh, that's the population. The blue is the excited state. And what I'm showing right now are the exact results just to show the physics. So you can see from time zero, the excited state has all the population and then it decays via emission to the bath. But there's a driving term which drives the system to some non-equilibrium steady state as indicated by the populations on the right part of this uh, plot. Okay, and so here's the results. So the, the symbols are what are obtained from, uh, again, the same IBM, I believe it was Rome. And uh, you can see you get pretty good agreement. Um, this is a, you know, a representative example, but it at least uh, shows the proof of principle. And that is that in fact, real-time evolution of dissipative systems, spin systems can be simulated on NISC devices 
uh, using this scheme and particularly the important role of this kite algorithm. All right, so with that, I am uh, ready to finish up. So today I've described uh, how we're able to include finite temperature dynamics and uh, the dynamics of dissipative quantum systems. And we were able to simulate them on up to four qubits on, on IBM hardware. And I think you know, our goal was to, to learn about the capabilities of these superconducting microwave quantum systems and to stimulate further development. And I think we now have a pretty good understanding of the capabilities as well as the uh, drivers of the specific issues that we would like to address in terms of the hardware development. So with that, I would like to thank the funding source and I particularly want to thank IBM for their extensive help in getting the hardware results that I showed. It's also been a real pleasure to collaborate with Dr. Mario Mata and his colleagues. And finally, thank you to the organizers again uh, for the invitation. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Austin, for the great talk uh, and, and the sort of many nice results on the different schemes. And it seems like you've you really had a nice way to figure out how to, you know, leverage uh, Kite into a number of different techniques and proposals. So it's really nice to see. Um, folks, uh, feel free to post final questions here in the chat for Austin as we get close to wrapping up. Um, maybe for, as a sort of first follow up, Austin, um, you, and maybe you've given us a little bit on that, but would you like to also tell us uh, sort of more on what you think might be next for this direction of research and and kite or you know what are some some of the next things that you think you would be excited about uh, in this? Sure. Yeah. There's a, there's a handful of things. I'll just focus on a few. So first, you know, one of the things that we've learned, and uh, other folks have come to this conclusion as well, but you know, we've learned that a lot of the uh, errors that you, you apparently see on the user side are not because of stochastic reasons or just you know un random errors but it's because the gates that you actually implement are just not quite what you thought they were meaning you're consistently implementing some gate but it's just not the one that you thought and so if you can characterize that gate uh, more precisely then you can uh, account for that and so that's a way that one could possibly improve the quality of the results. Um, I think we're, we're also working on uh, just you know, going beyond these toy models and trying to include or describe more complicated Hamiltonians that have kind of different types of physics in them and hope that we can observe that on the output. So those are, um, I would say those are kind of two examples of where we're going with this work. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I can I can attest to that um, as well in terms of how important it is to understand uh, the the underlying gates and uh, I think maybe some of those kinks we saw throughout your talk were probably some of that coherent uh, error as well. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, good. I, I think with that um, we can probably also leave it up to you if you want to share any final thoughts, comments. Um, you know, or um, other commentary you had for folks, because uh, I think otherwise I will begin our uh, thank you for, you know, joining kind of speech. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have uh, anything further to say, except I just appreciate everybody tuning in. And um, I hope you're able to continue. I hope we can, really, maybe the message is, I hope we can continue this open spirit of scientific inquiry uh, for people you know, everywhere. Uh, and I think it's great that people are tuning in from, from so many different places. So thank you again. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Austin. I, I completely concur and agree with that open source uh, and you know, open spirit of science. Um, maybe one final question here from the audience um, on clarification. When you say, oh, well, it just disappeared. <laughs> so I guess that might be reposted. But otherwise, I think Austin, uh, you can't see the chat, but I can relate to you that there are many uh, sort of messages from people thanking you and saying, great talk. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, maybe the final question was when you say without ANSATS based variational scheme, uh, but you're using the trotterized uh, evolution, could you maybe clarify a little bit on that? Sure. Um, what I'm referring to when I say ANSATS based is the, uh, the wave function is, is chosen to have a specific form 
and it has adjustable parameters in it. Uh, and and in that sense, the wave function is limited in the in the range of wave functions it can represent. So kite in its original uh, form doesn't have that requirement. Um, so that that's what I'm referring to. Mm. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much, Austin. Well, I think with that, folks, I'd like to thank you for tuning in today for all the wonderful questions, discussion in the chat. The video will stay live uh, on the YouTube channel, live in the sense that you can go back and rewatch it. Um, I think uh, subscribe, and you know, next week we will also see you on Friday at the same time. But importantly, I want to thank Austin for accepting the invitation for the wonderful talk, uh, Austin, you've given today. And uh, I think with that, thank you, Austin. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, it was a pleasure, as always. And we will see you next Friday at noon. Excuse me, not next Friday. Next Friday is APS March meeting. We will see you the following Friday, following APS March meeting at noon Eastern time. Uh, until then, uh, it was great to having you here, Austin. We'll see you back sometime. Great. Thank you again. Take care.